Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation, whose mission is uh, to advance science uh, using the acronym PERSONAL, which can be described at uh, FindingGeniusFoundation.org. Today, my guest is Matthew Vanderheiden. He's a principal investigator. He's part of the Vanderheiden Lab, uh, associate professor of biology. All of this is at uh, MIT, um, and we're going to talk about his cancer research. So, Matthew, thanks for coming. My pleasure. Happy to be here. Yeah, I know tons and tons of people are working on cancer in various facets. So what's your, uh, what's your view on it? What are you focused on? Yeah, so, so I bring, um, at least within MIT, maybe a slightly unique perspective to cancer in that, you know, I trained as, a, as an oncologist. So I see cancer patients. I have a pretty small practice, but really focus much of my time on, on cancer research because I feel like if we're really going to make a difference in this disease, we have to understand fundamental things that we don't know because that's really the way to make progress in cancer. And the specific area of research that my lab focuses on is trying to understand the metabolism of of, of cancer cells. And so, you know, what metabolism is, is it's basically, it's how cells, tissues, people take up nutrients from their environment, and then how they transform those nutrients in a way that allows things to survive, grow, etc. And it's been known for a very long time that in cancer, part of tumor formation and cancer spreading involves changes in how they use nutrients in their environment. And effectively, my lab tries to understand that process so we can better understand the drugs that we have today in the clinic and hopefully someday mm. find better drugs. Okay. From what I understand, I guess the Warburg effect says that uh, cancer has to use a different respiration pathway. Instead of oxidative phosphorylation, they have to use glycolysis and their mitochondria are damaged. So since we're talking, I guess, metabolism, what, what do you observe in your studies? Yeah, so you're referring to, you know, what arguably is one of the oldest findings in all of cancer science. Um, really, the first, you know, molecular difference that was noticed between cancer cells and normal cells had to do with exactly what you're referring to, something called the Vorberg effect after the person who originally founded a German biochemist back in the 1920s. And effectively, what he found was is that cancer cells take up more sugar, a specific sugar called glucose, and they tend to ferment that sugar rather than burn it using a process called called respiration. Now, exactly what that means, I think, you know, you you made a reference there to that, you know, this is a switch from one type of metabolism to another. In a lot of ways it is, but I think there's, you know, I, you know, I think there's some, some details there that end up being, being really interesting to try to understand that process and happy to talk about those more if you want. It gets into the weeds. Metabolism works. Yeah, let's go into it. Definitely. Yeah. I only know surface level. So yeah, please describe that. Yeah, sure. Sure. Happy to go into it. But I will say, but it does form the basis for some things that are actually really useful in the clinic. So, you know, FDG PET scanning is used in patients a lot. And that's really based on part of part of this observation, the fact that cancers use more sugar. than What, what is FGP? So FDG PET scanning, it stands for fluorodeoxyglucose PET scanning. And basically, cancer patients usually would know it as what's called a PET scan, P-E-T, like your pet, a dog, but it stands for positron emission tomography. And it's basically a fancy way of imaging that looks at glucose being taken up by tissues in the body. And it was found by researchers, you know, several decades ago now that they can use this test to basically leverage what this observation was, this increased glucose metabolism to actually visualize where tumors are in the patient. And, and, I, and I think that really illustrates the power of really understanding this, right? If we can use this property to actually find a tumor on a scan, well, maybe if we understood this property better, we could also maybe find a better way to treat. So what, what will be observed on a scan like this, um, places where there's clusters of tumor cells, they'll light up 
under the scan or what will they look like? Yep, exactly. Yeah, it's basically, yeah, patients will go into a scanner and basically a map of their body will be shown and there's a spot on the on the scan that basically said, oh, the tumor is here because it lights up because it uses more sugar. And it's those places on a scan that can oftentimes be used. You know, it's less of a diagnostic. It's usually much more used in patients as a way to know, oh, if you have cancer, how far is that cancer spread? Because it's a pretty sensitive test to tell you if the cancer is spread to different locations and that can help with clinical. Okay, gotcha. In looking at those scans, are there any parts of the body that are surprisingly lit up close to the amount that uh, cancer cells will be lit up or no? Yes. So originally when this test was developed, one thing people noticed or used it for is actually the brain. And so the other part of medicine that this test is used for is actually to interrogate different parts of the brain, often to look at, you know, if people are having thinking problems, you know, different kinds of dementias, you know, people will do an FTG PET scan and look at glucose uptake in the brain and try to look at, are there some parts of the brain that aren't using as much glucose as they used before? And that can help distinguish between different forms of of, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's disease or other types. So yes, there are other parts of the body that take up glucose, but it's really the brain and tumors kind of rival the brain in this regard. So you were talking about uh, the respiration pathways, you know, for cancer cells. So, you know, what are some details about them that you think are important? But, but some of this has to do with, with how metabolism works. Um, And, you know, in the way that our bodies get energy from food is they effectively do exactly the same chemical reaction that occurs when you burn something. Okay. So if you take a log, which is made out of, you know, sugar, and you light it on fire, a chemical reaction takes place where you take the sugar in the log and you turn it into CO2 and water. And of course, it requires oxygen to do that. So it's oxygen plus the sugar turns into carbon dioxide and water. And basically, our bodies do exactly the same chemical reaction, but obviously, they do it in a way that it doesn't get so hot and cause damage, right? It's done in a more controlled way that allows you to harvest energy ATP, things like that, that people may have learned about that then helps your cell do things that otherwise it wouldn't be able to do because it requires energy. And that's pretty much something that all life that's not photosynthetic does. And because getting energy is so important, alternative pathways have been developed that help you get energy if you don't have oxygen around. And so It turns out that you can't burn something without oxygen. Most people know that. You can't light a fire if there's no air, if there's no oxygen around. But in our bodies, there's actually an alternative way that you can burn sugar that doesn't involve oxygen. And this is what fermentation is. And of course, people know that this has been taken advantage of for food preservation for, you know, millennia. And Today, people know it best because this is really the process by which people make, you know, alcohol, beer and wine and other spirits, right? How, how you use microorganisms. And so people who have done their own home brewing know that you have to limit the amount of oxygen if you want to have your yeast make the alcohol that you're trying to have them make. And our body really makes the same decision. If there's oxygen around, you tend to do the oxygen consuming burning reaction, similar to burning wood. And if there's not oxygen around, then you tend to do the fermentation reaction. Although we don't make alcohol, we make a different product called lactate. Quick quick question here. Um, I've heard hyperbaric oxygen may be useful for cancer. Is a possible reason because um, you flood the tissues with high levels of oxygen that um, this preferred metabolic pathway and and cancer um, gets shut down or downregulated in favor of uh, the normal pathways? Yeah. So, so the way hyperbaric oxygen works um, or is thought to work um, is a little bit different. It has a little bit to do with, again, the details of how these pathways work and what goes wrong. And, and, and there's a little bit of a, a risk to doing the burning. And then if you're doing the burning, the, the way that that burning cycle works to get energy by using oxygen, what is in biology called respiration, you know, respiration you think of as breathing as a human, but cells do respiration and that's the burning of oxygen in the cell. And when cells do that, a byproduct of that pathway can be making molecules called reactive oxygen species, which is the same way bleach kills things. It's the same thing. Bleach is a way to make reactive molecules and those are naturally made by the body during the process of respiration. 
And one idea is, is that hyperbaric oxygen is you really force more of these pathways to happen. And maybe you make more of those toxic things that can kill cancers, but it actually gets to one of the misconceptions about you know, you know, that many people have about, about this Warburg effect in cancer and that many people view it as, you know, a shift from where you no longer do the reactions that require oxygen to now that you only do the fermentation reaction. And in reality, what happens is, is that you always continue to burn oxygen, but now you tend to take up more glucose and that extra glucose that is taken up is shifted over to do fermentation and to get to your hyperbaric oxygen. And I, I don't think it's been fully proven that this is effective in all cases or not. And I think if this is very much a research question, where best to use it, but at least this relies on the fact that there still is some oxygen burning, some respiration going on in cells. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. And that if you flood that system, maybe you can create more of these toxic species that might, you know, slow the tumor. At least that's the theory behind it, as I understand. Right. Okay. So let's, you know, keep going into the pathways. So what kind of products are created in fermentation and what's, how is it important clinically and health-wise? Yeah. So, so this has really been a longstanding question that for the last hundred years, people have really tried to understand it. There's been lots of ideas put forth for why cells might pick one pathway or another, because the big mystery is, is that cancer cells tend to do fermentation, even though there's still plenty of oxygen around, which is the opposite of beer brewing, right? If you're brewing beer, you take the oxygen away to force cells to do fermentation. But this is deciding to do fermentation, even when you don't have to. And, you know, there's lots of things that have been put forward. And we can talk more about those if you want. But the, but the, the bottom line is, is that this is really something that doing what cancer cells do isn't actually all that unique to cancer. It turns out anything that's dividing really fast to a certain extent does this same property. That is, it takes up more sugar and it tends to ferment more of that sugar. And so I guess I would argue is it probably reflects something about the way cells change the way that they're using the food in their environment to help them grow, which is really very different than what most of our cells are doing, right? Hopefully as adults, we're not growing, right? We're just sitting there. And so our cells don't need to grow. They just need to, they still need to use energy in order to live and carry out their function, but we don't want them to grow. And I think the shift back to a metabolism that then allows them to grow for whatever reason, um, and again, there's ideas about this, might favor a way that you can now change the way the cell works to now allow it to go not from where it's just supporting normal functions, but to where now it's saying, all right, let's go and start building more cells. Let's start using the food we have to grow and divide, which of course is a problem. And so what are some of the end products again of fermentation? Is it lactates? You know, what are, what are the end products versus uh, oxfos? Yeah. Yeah. So, so in a lot of ways, the end products are the same. Both processes, what every undergraduate and medical student and increasingly high school student learns is that the end product of either of these pathways is ATP. You're right. The other end product of, of the reactions is consuming oxygen to water, that's respiration, or it's making lactate. And a lot of the explanations have really focused on what is the benefit of making lactate. And, and I guess what we would argue is going on is that this really has to do with the additional complexity of how these pathways work and that the chemistry of how cells make things in order to grow, things like the pieces that they need to do DNA. Remember, if you're going to divide as a cell, you have to make, you have to duplicate your genetic material, your DNA, which means you have to make a whole bunch of the pieces, all of the A, G's, and T's that are necessary to build a new genome so you can make a new cell. Those things chemically 
require you to dispose of the electrons that are made in the chemical reactions. Effectively, you know, this gets into chemistry, but 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 why cells do respiration? Why they turn oxygen into water or why they make lactate or ethanol? If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. What those things do is those effectively become a way that you can dispose of extra electrons that are required to take a molecule from one thing to another. So remember, mass can't be created or destroyed. And so if you start with a piece of food, like a sugar molecule, and you want to turn it into something else, CO2 or lactate or DNA, electrons end up getting removed. And it's the removal of those electrons that then have to go somewhere. And the places those go is oxygen or lactate. And what we think might be going on in this process is, is that because the way the electrons are disposed of in respiration, that's coupled to the process of making ATP as energy. But if you're going to do other types of reactions that require you to now dispose of those electrons to make things like DNA, that if you're growing fast enough that the demand to do that can exceed the demand that's required to make ATP. That is, the cell has a higher demand to make stuff than it has to make ATP. And if that's the case, now your ability to use respiration to dispose of those electrons gets capped. And so now you spill over and start doing more fermentation. And I think why I like that explanation is it explains not just why cancer cells do this, but it explains why other instances in in nature from microorganisms up to non-cancer human cells might do the same thing when they're growing really fast. But in the end, I think what it's telling us is about how cells are actually rewiring their metabolism in order to grow really fast. So if I looked at cells in my body, I would expect maybe the cells, the cells that are near the nail beds and maybe the lining of my intestine and my gut um, and other fast growing places that chemotherapy unfortunately targets. That's where I would tend to see more lactate production, more fermentation. That's exactly what the prediction would be. Measuring that turns out to be much harder than you might think, but there is evidence that that, that from some studies that that may indeed be. What about, I know this is like kind of way out there, but I was thinking about people with sleep apnea or, you know, when would temporary hypoxic conditions occur in a person? You know, yeah. heavy exercise. Would, I guess, I guess, heavy exercise. If you go past your normal aerobic threshold, it happens too, right? Your cells convert to more lactate, or again, if you have sleep apnea, yeah. those people may have more lactate production, etc. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. And in fact, and, and and in fact, we've used exactly those arguments that you're making right there as a way to say that you know, oxygen is an electron disposal thing is actually must be at some level limiting for many cells in our body. Now, why that is, is a interesting separate discussion. And whether that relates to what I just said, again, is by is not as far from proven. I'm someone who really likes to be honest about where the limits of what we truly understand are and are not. But I find that very provocative. And actually, the example I give to this to people is cyclists and whatnot, you know, they go out and do all this blood doping, right? Why do people do blood doping? Well, they do blood doping because it helps oxygen delivery. And if you're an elite athlete, that must give you an edge. And the fact that people continue to do this, even though it's considered cheating and gets them barred from cycling federations and stuff like that tells you at some level it must work. And so it really says oxygen can be limiting. You know, I think the most interesting place to think about where oxygen might, you know, sort of the natural human experiment of this has to do with, you know, people who live at very high altitude, right? Anyone who's ever gone to high altitude, you know, to go skiing or visit national parks, go hiking high in the mountains, knows you get really out of breath, you get hypoxic, the higher up you go. And there are, of course, people that, you know, whole communities of people who, you know, civilizations that have existed, you know, Tibet and, you know, other places in that part of the world that, you know, live their whole existence at 14, 15, 16,000 feet. And it's actually interesting. Cancer rates, people have looked at this, you know, this is obviously hard to tie exactly to what this is, but there's at least been some provocative suggestions that maybe cancer rates might be different for people living at very different, you know, elevations perhaps related to the oxygen. So I don't know, how can this be harnessed in treating cancer? You know, perhaps hyperbaric oxygen, but, you know, what are some of the clinical possibilities that you've seen that seem to be substantiated? Yeah, so so the way we've thought about harnessing this, 
really comes down to, and, you know, again, as an oncologist, I always like to remind people that, you know, and you brought it up, you know, chemotherapy, no one wants chemotherapy. It's, it's a, you know, it can be tough, tough medicine sometimes, but, but we give it to people and we give it to people because, because it works. And, you know, and it often gets a bad name because of the side effects. But if you cut through the side effects, what I love to remind people of is that there's a lot of cancers that we actually cure with chemotherapy. And this includes, of course, things like childhood leukemias, but it's also things that people don't often think of as chemotherapy curing, but it's exactly what's going on. So many people who have, say, localized breast cancer, right, they get their surgery and radiation, but then they also get chemotherapy. And what that chemotherapy is doing is it's, it's helping to cure people because fewer people then get disease later, and it's killing the disease somewhere else in the body. And chemotherapy is somehow sometimes billed as a bad name as being nonspecific poison. And some of it is a little bit certainly poison, but the nonspecific part isn't always fair because some of our best chemotherapies out there actually target enzymes and metabolism. And they target very specifically often enzymes that have to do with exactly some of the pathways I was talking about, the enzymes that are important to make DNA or in, you know, in various ways. And one thing that is very striking is that the drugs that do that can be phenomenal drugs, contribute to cures in some cancer, and they don't work in other cancers, which really challenges the notion that they only work by attacking all dividing cells. Yes, they do attack dividing cells. This is why they cause problems with your gut and your skin and hair falling out and things like that. However, the cells in your gut are proliferating much faster than any tumors, and two tumors proliferating at the same rate that one may respond to those drugs and other ones won't, which I think tells you right off the bat that it's not so simple as they're just attacking all dividing cells. Instead, what we think is going on is that different cancers in the body must be more sensitive to the enzymes those drugs target, which also those cancers must be more sensitive than the normal cells, because even though they have side effects, the side effects are at least to a certain extent tolerable. They obviously could be better, but they are to a certain extent tolerable. But I think it's really been trying to turn that problem on its head and think about it that way that for me has really been an eye opener because because thinking about the chemistry of what might be going on in some of these things, that there might be a limit to the chemical reactions that allow you to say make DNA because of these things with oxygen limitation and why you might do fermentation or not. But if that chemistry is ultimately limiting, maybe it now creates a situation where you have some tumors that have to use that chemistry and have the resources to use that chemistry to make their DNA, and they're sensitive to one kind of chemotherapy. But then you might have other cancers that don't have that, so then maybe more dependent on instead of building the things they need, they can now basically salvage them from their environment. And some of our drugs work in that way. And it's at least been exciting for us as we've started to look on a cancer by cancer basis, what are the tumors that are sensitive to the drugs that stop the synthesis? And what are the drugs that stop the salvage? That those actually are starting to line up pretty well with things that might fit into a way to think through these differences in chemistry that could be causing this to happen. And so what about uh, glutamine, though? I thought that uh, it was not just glucose, but glutamine is a major fuel for cancer cells. Has that been looked at? Yeah, no, it absolutely has. But but it was actually thinking about things like glutamine, because, you know, I want to take a step back and say there's lots of fuels for cancer cells. And this is really, I think, what's different about different cancers in different parts of our body is that, you know, we tend to think of, you know, often when we study cancer in the lab, we grow it in a dish and we use medias that have been developed 60 years ago that all have the same thing in it. But the reality is, is cancers in our body have different foods available to them. And, and some, some recent work we've done, and others have done this too, have found that the metabolism the cells do is very much constrained by what's in your environment. And different locations in the body seem to have different food available to them. And this is not a property of the cancer, but rather a property of the tissue. And so what do I mean by that? Well, your lung, cells in your lung have a certain mix of food available to them. And cells in your liver have a different mix of food available to them. 
And yes, glucose may be in both places. And so FDG PET scan works because cancer will take up glucose in both places. But maybe in one place, there's a lot of glutamine and another place there's not, or there's a lot of fat in one place and another place there's not, or there's a lot of DNA building blocks in one place and another place there's not. And we're finding that different locations in the body have access to different things. And it's actually the puzzle of how the cancer becomes dependent on taking up certain things from its environment where then it has to use the limiting resources that it has to make stuff to then make all of the other things. And it's really that puzzle that we think ultimately leads to specific cancers being dependent on specific pathways, either to acquire resources or to make them, whether they make them from glutamine or whether they make them from something else or take them up, if that makes sense. Well, what about the localized microbiome? If a cell starts to go more towards fermentation, I think pretty quickly the localized microbes that trade metabolites with it would change. And you could observe that as well. Has that even been considered? Yeah, it's it's definitely been considered. And there's a lot of really exciting work going on in that area about how the microbiome might affect cancer. But I'll push back. I think the microbiome is just another bit of the, it's the, you know, at the highest level, it's really what food is present in each location in the body. And yes, the microbiome may be part of the determinant of that. But in the end, it's just another layer of complexity of what might control the food available. Now, that's an exciting way to think about how different microbiomes might contribute differently to cancer growing in different locations, right? Maybe you have to have the right bacteria to make the right food that's necessary for the cancer to grow. You know, that's very speculative, of course, but there's certainly, that's certainly a, um, a possibility. Well, but we do know from observation that cancer cells, at least some of them, are fermenting more than they were doing oxfos. So they'll, you know, again, if it's like a, you know, if it's a cooperative relationship, mutualistic, and I'm a bacteria that hangs out near a cell, yep. all of a sudden now I'm not getting the products I used to get and I'm getting yep. something else. I may not be able to consume them. I may starve. I have, may have to change my, my, you know, m- metabolic pathways to be able to eat the new stuff. Maybe there's competitors that are better yep. suited to eat lactate and they push me out. So I would think that it would lead to a changeover pretty quickly. Yeah. And again, localized yeah, no. Microbiome. yeah, no, I love exactly where you're going with that. And that is, is absolutely true and a really great idea. And one that people have looked at, and I should say, it's not just restricted to the microbiome, the exact same interactions must be going on between cancer cells and other normal cells in the environment, be they fibroblasts or immune cells. In fact, that's been one of the hottest areas of research, not from us, but from many people is sort of how does the tumor change the metabolism in its environment to affect the immune cells coming in to affect things like immunotherapy. And and there is actually some very nice studies that we've done some of these, but others have as well, that show specific examples about how nutrients can be shared between cancer cells and non-cancer in the environment. Fewer studies relating that to the microbiome, although there are a couple of those too, but, but I think it really illustrates nicely exactly what you just said, that there is you know, you can almost think of the tissues in our body as being ecosystems, right? You have many different players in there, diff- cells of different types are, you know, one cell type is making something that's good for another cell type. So that cell type in return will make something that's good for another cell type or maybe bad for a cell type. And that can really help shape the ecosystem of what's there in terms of cancer, microbiome, parts of the immune system that might reject the cancer, parts of the immune system that might allow the cancer to grow, other cells that recruit in blood vessels or et cetera. So I think there's there's a lot of really exciting possibilities going on there. And each of those possibilities is, you know, years worth of work to study, but I it's something that I'm excited about. And I think a lot of people are really... Well, in terms of sharing resources, is that done through extracellular vesicles? You know, does, do nutrients get packaged in them or is this like tunneling nanotubes or, you know, I, I don't know. How does this happen, do you think? Yeah, no, I mean... You, you, you just listed some of the more exotic ways that it might happen. I, you know, I think the simplest way that it might happen is, you know, just go back to fermentation. Like, what is that? That's an or a cell takes up glucose and it releases the waste lactate. And, you know, there's many ways in which cells take up things from their environment. In fact, most of the amino acids, for instance, you mentioned glutamine, much of amino acid transport actually involves exchanging one amino acid for another. And so, and so cells naturally take up small molecule metabolites, nutrients from their environment, and they excrete many metabolites, things that could be nutrients into their environment. And you don't have to invoke exotic things because 
that's been known to happen in all cells from bacteria to human cells really for a very long time. Now you bring up some other interesting possibilities. And I think, you know, these are some of the more intriguing things that have been suggested to occur. You know, there was a recent paper from a group out of New York that had a nice study that suggested, you know, maybe neuron projections into the tumor could be providing certain nutrients that are excreted that way, you know, and certainly there's ideas that maybe there's bridges made between cells that can allow nutrient exchange and things like that. Very possible. Certainly it's been suggested from some studies. I think we're a long way from proving that. And then you brought up the extracellular vesicle idea. I, I have to say I'm a little skeptical that the extracellular vesicle idea is a major way that cells exchange nutrients, at least cancer cells, only because there's a bit of a stoichiometry problem. I think there's far more far more material in the environment as free molecules, just from a you know number of molecules present. Because remember, you know, often metabolism you know, you require strength in numbers when you're looking at things like gene expression, where clearly extracellular vesicles can play a role. Now you can have much fewer molecules actually exert an effect because it has an amplifier built into it. That is, the vesicle can then change something that is then amplified and the gene being turned on. Whereas metabolism, you need the stoichiometry to be more one-to-one. But that doesn't mean that there aren't nutrients that are shared by extracellular vesicles. And indeed, there are some data out there. I, I, I suspect that that's probably a better way to share things like fats, which are not as soluble as mm. things like sugars. But of course, sugars and proteins might be shared that way, too. That's very popular. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know of anyone that knows, uh, you know, inbound EVs, does this, you know, do they just open up inside the cell and the contents are used? Or is the entire EV reconstituted and the membrane reused? And Maybe yeah. that's a source of lipids. I mean, and then the biogenesis yeah. of them too. I mean, who, who decides the packaging? And it's just, I know it's a whole area that's that's not known very well yet. But Yeah, yeah. No, it's a really exciting. It's not an area my lab is focused on, but it but it is, is an area you're absolutely right that, um, you know, a lot of people have thought about. What about cancers that come from viruses like HPV and maybe a few others? Have those been studied? And do they see the same change over from you know, oxfos to fermentation or... Are there different mechanisms at play there and how do they happen? Yeah. So, you know, the virally associated cancers have been studied actually quite a bit. And in fact, they also do a lot of the same, you know, a lot of the same metabolic things occur in many of them. In fact, there's a, you know, there's a group at UCLA, Heather Kristoff, who actually done some really nice work on comparing how viruses change metabolism to how cancer changes metabolism and found a lot of similarities and a lot of you know, in a lot of things, which, which is exciting. I'm, I'm not aware of any thing that really is super special about the virus induced cancers being somehow metabolically different from other forms of cancer. And it's an interesting possibility. I guess I don't know anyone who studied it in enough detail to really know if there's something there. Like, you know, Heather has done some nice work really asking what are the commonalities between viral infection and cancer, but the virus induced transformation that may have been studied out there, but I'm blanking on if that's been. Yeah. Well, I know the cancer field is very expansive. There's so much to look at. So yeah, it's, it's really I can't possibly know everything. Yes, of course. Yeah. Well, what are some uh, hypotheses that you're, you feel like maybe in the next year or two, you're going to make some traction on? Yeah. I mean, I think something that at least we've been excited about recently is, is really, you know, sort of piggybacking on this, that different environments across, um, across cancers could be a thing that constrains metabolism in a way that might influence therapy response has really got us to think about what are ways we could change that environment. And of course, a way that one can do that is what we eat to a certain extent, what we eat affects which nutrients are available in different places in our body. And, you know, the whole idea of, how what we eat relates to cancer is, I think, one of the, certainly patients are very interested in this, and many people are interested in this, and it's something that I I talk about and have gone into with somewhat trepidation, only because one can sound a little crazy sometimes talking about diet and cancer. But nonetheless, I do think there is some very nice data out there that diet can have effects on cancer. And we're at least excited about the possibility that maybe we can use approaches we have to really understand how different diets affect which foods are available inside the tumor as a way to better understand how diet interacts mechanistically and to affect nutrient levels in a tumor to maybe influence it 
which I think could open up what is always been something on people's mind, but how can we best adapt or suggest diets that might, you know, optimally help people know what they should do to either, you know, keep their cancer at bay. I don't think we're curing cancer with diet, but, you know, maybe line the right diets up to help our existing therapies work better. Well, very good. Uh, What's the best way for people to find out more about your work? Where can they go? So, you know, of course, it's always good to, to, uh, to check out our website, um, you know, and read the scientific literature, of course, is the best way we always try to publish our work. Um, But, but, but for non scientists who don't want to read the, you know, the full scientific literature, I think the Koch Institute at MIT, where I work, we, uh, we try to have links on there to work going on, not just in my lab, but other labs throughout, um, throughout our cancer center. And that includes occasional links to talks that I or some of my colleagues have given on these topics, as well as, you know, various articles written for, for uh, different audiences, you know, and of course, contact information is us and is on there too. And I, within reason, I always do my best to respond to people who ask me questions. I maybe I don't say saying that, but I do, I do. always. No problem. No problem. Well, very good, Matthew. Thanks for coming on the podcast. It's been a great call. Great. It's I've enjoyed talking to you. I hope it was helpful. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.